Hello, and welcome to the Physical Therapy Owners Club. I am Nathan Shields, and today I've got a new guest, John Bradley. He's the partner of a, a multi-time guest, Stephen Rapicelli, who you might have listened to on the podcast before, but John is the CEO of Performance Physical Therapy with three clinics in Northern Delaware. John, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Nathan, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's great to bring you on because I want to talk, this might be, what we have planned is this going to be a two-part episode or two-part podcast uh, where we're going to spend a couple episode, episodes talking about leadership. And it's, it's a common question, a common concern for those physical therapy clinic owners who are looking to grow and expand beyond the solo practitioner, um, maybe even into multi-clinic situations where uh, leadership is necessary if if you're going to expand your influence and expand your reach, especially in a community. So it's it's vital that we be clear as to what leadership looks like, how to develop it in our team, and how to become better leaders ourselves. So to jump right off, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what how leadership has been viewed, how leadership is seen across time, because you and I were on the older side, working class in physical therapy, and how we view leadership is going to be significantly different than the new physical therapists that are coming out of school right now, right? Totally different Absolutely. generations, totally different ideas of leadership. Some of that appropriate, some of it not, but let's start there. And, and what are you saying? Because you're talking to some of the students, you're doing presentations about leadership at the PT programs near you. And you're talking to the students about what leadership looks like to them. And of course, you come from the mold probably that I came from. What are you seeing? What are some of the differences that you're seeing in terms of leadership and the expectations there? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a great place to start. You know, I think that generationally, there has been a real shift in the understanding of what leadership is. You know, I consider myself incredibly fortunate to have been the child of World War II generation parents. And the whole concept of the greatest generation, which I don't think anybody would argue differently, a generation that really was marked by countless episodes of self-sacrifice, service, you're always looking out for your neighbor. You know, you're not waiting for somebody to come and ask you for help. You are walking toward them and asking them, how can I help you? Whether they needed help or not, it's just an innate desire to help. Right. And I think that was, that was a, a foundational, you know, ingredient in our parents, you know, probably born out of, of very, very challenging times. You know, my, my, both of my parents were born in 1929, you know, depression grew up in post-depression where we didn't have, you know, five of everything, you know, they grew up often experiencing want that none of us will ever probably experience, thank goodness. And I think that that adversity, whether it was perceived as adversity or not, you know, and my, and, and my parents said many times over the years, they didn't know they were poor. They didn't know they didn't have. And I think part of that was this modeling that was, that was occurring where they were seeing their parents, even though they didn't have a lot, they were seeing their parents going to other people and asking, how can we help? You know, they were kind of giving out of their lack. And I think that as our, you know, culture, particularly in the U.S., has gotten wealthier and, you know, uh, luxuries have become more widely distributed and available, you know, the idea of lack really doesn't, it doesn't, it's not in front of us. You know, as the generations have moved forward, we don't see that like they did in the 1930s and 1940s and post-war era. And I think that people in the succeeding generations, you know, not necessarily through any fault of their own, they become very affected by what the culture is teaching. And, and, you know, I mean, there was a period of time when, you know, the teaching of younger people was largely by parents and educators. And now, you know, there are a multitude of teachers, you know, we've got, you know, teachers who are on this thing from all different parts of the world, different perspectives. And, you know, it's in an almost an unfiltered way, you know, there's just whatever you want to listen to, it's out there. Right. And I think that there is, you know, culturally more a focus on what's good for me, 
you know, and, and, I, and I've often had conversations with people, you know, very important conversations, you know, at times about performance and behavior. And I always use the example that, you know, what, what our culture as a company is, our company can't be an individual with everyone else circulating around them. Mm-hmm. Okay, we can't have that. And unfortunately, that's the, that's the, the cultural message that, that a lot of people are being delivered today. Right through all types of avenues. And, and I think, you know, whether you're a, you know, a YouTube influencer with half a million subscribers, whether you, you know, have this incredible TikTok channel, you know, I think leadership has gone from service to fame. You know, how famous are you? You know, how many followers do you have? And just that very dynamic, that word follower, you know, it's, it's creating you know, kind of a false sense of what a leader really is. The attraction to a follower is often more voyeuristic than anything. Mm-hmm. You know, do you really, are you really on board with that person's mission? Or is it more about the way they appear and the way they sound? Mm. Is it style versus substance? I think that's right. another way, a very catchy yeah. way, you know, to, to think about this. So I think that leadership has shifted from, you know, what can I do? as a leader in my position to help the person behind me, help the person to my right and my left. It shifted, I think, more to how can I get ahead? Right. How can I get ahead? It's more related to accomplishment, I think, Mm -hmm. than service. Yeah, I could see that it goes from a team-centered approach to a more selfish approach. And what the younger generation, what it sounds like you're saying is, their idea of leadership, should it be coming from an influencer or or someone on media, they're not experiencing leadership in a one-to-one personal relationship because what they experience as leadership from an influencer point of view is someone who says something and I can take it or leave it and there's no accountability related to that. And it's up to me if I want to improve it, but it's all about improving myself. And I'll take what's good from them and try to improve it. But there's no one there. There's no need f- to develop the one-on-one personal relationship with that quote unquote influencer. That just doesn't happen. You can pay for that if you want, but that's not typically there. And like you said, it, it's all about improving yourself. I think it also goes back to, and again, I'm not saying this is bad, but your parents, my parents, they would have more than likely stayed with the same company for 30, 40, 50 years until they retired compared to now you're going to be switching jobs every four to five years and doing so increase your wages and et cetera, and your skills and opportunities. Again, not saying that's bad, but that's just, that's just indicative of the difference that we're seeing as it pertains to how these generations view leadership. And so now for, um, for PT owners who are dealing with um, people who might have different ideas of leadership, how are you recommending those owners approach the individuals? Do they, do they need to be mindful and have um, a customized approach to leadership as it pertains to the people that they're working with? Or are you finding some commonalities that work across generations? Uh, what are you recommending? Well, it, it's a great question. And, and to kind of footnote one of your, the comments you made uh, just a moment ago, I do think that there are a lot of people in the more recent generations who are demonstrating exceptional true leadership, you know, mm-hmm. through, through um, behaviors that, that really focus on service um, and, and elevating the people around them. And however, I think it is, it is, there, I think those, those instances and those individuals are very much underreported and unrecognized because it's not a, it's not a fashionable style of behavior. Well, it's not you being know, reported it, and posted on social media. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, oftentimes these, these leadership behaviors that I think are so important to cultivate in our, in our younger clinicians as they're developing are the silent things, you know, they're the, they're the little things that aren't going to be posted, you know, as, as, you know, on Instagram, it's not going to be an Instagram reel or a Facebook reel. It's going to be the little stuff. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll, as we get deeper down the farther down the road, I'll, I'll give a lot of examples of that, but mm-hmm. you know, the, how do you, 
how do you try to teach you this? I guess that's really, you know, comes, it comes back to if we recognize and admit that there is a problem, there's a deficit in an understanding of leadership and leadership behavior, how do you do it? Well, that's one of the reasons why I've really have made an effort to try to reach out to educators in the PT programs and be very, very direct with them and talk about this stuff and say, do you have anything in your program that speaks to this? And almost, and almost, you know, to a person, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. You know, there really is no formal uh, training or, or presentation of the concepts of really what it means to be an effective leader. And and I think that it really needs to be clarified at that general level that we're not talking about everybody is you know trying to become the CEO. Right. Or everybody's going to try to become, you know, the the clinical director of, of 10 offices. It, it, you know, the, the leadership we're talking about is the leadership that, that occurs in a patient therapist patient relationship. It's the leadership behavior that that is going to be helpful when you're working with support staff upon whom you depend for your success. You know, the understanding that this isn't all about you, that, that there are people who support you in the mission and you, you want them to be on board with you. Mm -hmm. um, so getting, getting people to understand that, um, you know, that there has to be this kind of concept shift. That's the general thing. I do think there, 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 is, a, there is a lot of credibility for a customized approach to teaching this. And, you know, just as people have different learning styles for, didactic information, uh, technical skills. I think that leadership skills are, are learned differently by different people. I think overall, people will, uh, will absorb observed behaviors really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a younger clinician or someone perhaps at a tech level who's doing their undergrad and working their way through school and they're working in a PT clinic, they're, they're watching you. They are watching you whether you realize it or not and they're listening to you. And, and, and I'll share, if, if I can, I'll share an anecdote from many, many years ago. And, and this, you know, as, since we're all, you know, all PTs, this probably has some, hopefully resonates with everybody. You know, back when I was treating a full schedule of patients, this is, you know, a, a while ago, at that time, we had a, a fitness facility, basically a gym embedded in our largest PT office. And, you know, our, our patients, as we discharge them, often joined the fitness center and kept up with their exercise programs. And, you know, we kept touch with them as therapists. And, and we, had, um, we had exercise physiologists and personal trainers who were really, really good at working with our population, which is the middle-aged, older adult comorbidities, orthopedic issues, you know, it was a great, great, great setup. And, um, you know, a lot of our clients were elderly people and, and they had these, these physical challenges, medical challenges. So I distinctly remember this. Um, we had a, a gentleman who was elderly. Um, he was working with one of the exercise physiologists and he, uh, unfortunately, he had a, you know, a, an accident, you know, in, in the bathroom where he wasn't able to control himself. And, you know, the bathroom was really not in a very sanitary condition. And, you know, um, you know, he, we, we, you know, we gave him some, some clean clothes and, and, and he, you know, in a very, very embarrassed way he left, but we, you know, we, we, we handled it really well from a personal standpoint. And now we've got this bathroom. It's a patient bathroom. It's out of service. And we've got 25, 30 patients in the office. And we need to get this thing cleaned. And I wasn't treating any patients at the time. My schedule was, was open at that moment. I have a, you know, a clinic full of therapists and techs who are working like crazy, you know, getting their patients treated. And I, I go to the, 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 the gentleman who was working with him. And I said, okay, you know, the, there was, uh, there's a lot of, you know, got to clean this bathroom up. And he looks at me and he says, I've got a master's degree. I don't clean bathrooms. So at that time, I wasn't the CEO. I was the COO. You know, I didn't have any patient care duties. So I gowned up, put on a pair of gloves and filled up some buckets with disinfectant and went in with a bunch of rags. And 20 minutes later, I came out and that bathroom was spick and span like an operating room. And that's it. You know, I mean, I, we, we dealt with the, uh, the response of that gentleman uh, at a later date, but I never thought about it. I, that just, you know, it kind of went off my radar. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, 
one of the techs who was working that day at that time had finished her PT program and she just started working with us. We hired her. Oh, okay. And I knew her very well, you know, very easy interview process. Someone who's worked with, with you for a couple of years, you kind of know what they're about. So, uh, you know, she worked with us, she knew our culture and she pulled me aside one day and I, and I, and I, you know, we were talking about how it's going. And I said, I said, you know, aside from the fact you knew everybody here, like, why would you come back and work for us? Like, I'm just curious. Like, you know, what, what, what drew, you could have worked anywhere. And she said, John, I'll never forget the day you cleaned that bathroom. And you never said anything about it. You never complained. You just did it. And she said, that's why I came back to work here. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that to, to tell you that in that moment, I was thinking, hmm, let me see how I can model leadership behavior. All I knew is I've got a dirty bathroom. I've got 30 clients who are probably going to need this bathroom. I'm the only one not busy. I'm going to clean the bathroom. It was that level of thinking, and then I was done. But that proves my point. What I did that day, perhaps the lowest level task in the clinic in terms of maintaining a, a PT clinic, it got us somebody who was excellent therapist to work for us for years. So the observations, what you do is always being watched. So what you do on the positive and what you do on the negative. We've been in the game long enough. We all have anecdotes. I can, I can fill, the, fill the hours with stories of really bad leadership examples, <laughs> you know, from, from everyone. Myself included, you know, I, I, I like to tell people back when I wasn't thinking about this, I didn't have self or good self-awareness. I didn't have good um, self-management skills. I was all about me. I, I had all the answers. I'm the, I'm the, you know, the 10 year PT. I think I've seen it all now. You know, don't tell, don't, nothing you can do to impress me. I walked that walk and I, and I know, I know I left bodies by the side of the road mm -hmm. because of that level of thinking. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the first real step in teaching this is you really need to understand how you are or are not behaving in front of your staff. I know you've, you've done a lot of work on this and, and you've studied many resources on leadership. And so what have you taken from corporate America's view of leadership um, and been able to articulate that or present that to the healthcare side, the physical therapy, specifically healthcare side um, of leadership. Uh, what are some, how, how are you able to distill what you've learned at the corporate level down into physical mm -hmm. therapy? There, there, there is just an almost overwhelming amount of information available through all sources of all types of media on leadership theory training at, at corporate level. So, you know, you go from, you know, Southwest Airlines, Disney, Apple, you, you know, what, pick any corporation and just kind of, you know, scale, keep scaling it down to, to right. small to mid-sized corporations. There's just a ton of stuff. Um, I think what I have distilled over the years is there are really some very, very simple principles that permeate through all of that training, no matter who's writing the books, no matter who's speaking. Mm -hmm. I, I do have some, you know, leadership um, uh, experts that, that I think are really good. Uh, and I'll, I'll certainly share that and some books. I think that what really keeps coming back, no matter who you listen to, no matter whose book you read, is this idea of self-awareness. Like you really need to, to know yourself. You need to be able to, to, to step back and look at yourself. You know, if I back, you know, 20, 25 years ago, when I was, you know, arrogant, know-it-all young PT, and I was leaving the bodies by the side of the road, I didn't spend any time thinking about how people react to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just so, I was so enveloped in my own goals of, you know, you know, no, you know, worthy goals, getting patients better, you know, the PT skill sets, you know, all of that stuff that I was working so hard on building. It was all about me. It was about building me up. You're talking about that. You're talking about, were you an owner at the time? I imagine. Uh, yes. Yeah. So you're yes. talking about patient results, my KPIs. Absolutely. Sure, 
very objective. Absolutely. Right. Black and white stuff that I could control. You know, right. it was easy it was on paper, on a spreadsheet. I got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you measured I, yourself by those things. Yeah. I wasn't picking up on the clues that if, you know, if I knew then what I know now that, you know, there were certain techs who really didn't want to work with me, you know, that they, they found me scary. And, you know, for, I was probably exhibiting behaviors that were, that were intimidating, you know, that were very much focused on how are you going to serve me? You know? Yeah. Would at the time, did you care? <laughs> well, they, you know, to, 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 to a large extent, yeah, to a large extent, I didn't even know. You didn't know, but if you had known, would you have cared? If, if I had known, I I don't think then. Uh, I think I would have been I would have been very embarrassed because I think what okay. what would have been resounding in my head like a symbol would be my father or my mother. Okay, yeah. you know, I, I probably hear their voices in my head saying, "Step back." step back. I, you know, I look at myself as a young owner and if someone had been scared of me, I would have been like, okay, that's fine. This is, this is how it is working for me. Uh, you're going to, I'm going to get to the point and I'm not going to play Mr. Nice guy. Um, and that was, um, that was at a time. Yeah. Where my definition of your job was do whatever I tell you to do yeah yeah and and, and you and <laughs> yeah. oftentimes we cloaked ourselves in because it's for the patient doing what's you know? best for the patient doing what's best for the business this yeah is, exactly you know, best exactly business. and 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 so i think that you know the one of the underlying themes of all that corporate level leadership theory and training is self-awareness how to and how to manage yourself. In fact, those are the first two principles of I think one of the one of the most important books that every leader or someone who wants to improve their leadership should read, which is crucial. Which I'm sorry, which is uh, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Um, it, it's that book has been out for a long, long time. It is it is truly a timeless collection of really good, good advice and teaching and the first two the first two skills to master in emotional intelligence is self-awareness and then self-management i think that you know whoever's speaking about leadership if you listen very carefully a lot of the the denominators are those two things how in the moment this and this is where i fall short and i think for, i speak for a lot of people in the moment of maybe uh, of heat, uh, heated emotion, com confusion, um, whatnot, decision making. <sighs> what do you do to check yourself in those times? Oh, and if you're, if maybe if that's not a strong strong suit of yours, what is said <laughs> to be? <laughs> <how you check> yourself? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question because that's because that's real. I mean, we all, you know, I mean, going through any kind of leadership training, whether I'm presenting it, whether it's, you know, someone, you know, a, a world, a world-class leadership trainer, you know, everyone has these moments where, you know, you got your boiling point and everything seems to be going wrong. And, and you know, it, it's normal to have that emotional reaction. I think well, there were a couple of things. There was a, a story or a little, a little anecdote that I picked up many years ago. And um, someone was talking about this very issue. If you're in a rage because something really bad has happened, mm -hmm. um, and 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 you and you you go off, I mean, you you start to really react badly. You know, you can see, and, and there's plenty of justification for why that would happen. <laughs> um, and you're you know you're saying things you shouldn't say. Your voice is elevated. You're you know, you're being very scary to the people around you. If someone came up to you and said. I'm going to give you a million dollars right now if you just stop and calm down. Would you stop and calm down? For sure. Yeah. The illusion that you have is that you don't have control of yourself when you actually do. Right. And, and so I think that part of that is that self-management. It's, it's the awareness that I really don't lack control. I can stop. Mm -hmm. I can stop. 
or I can start, but I can stop. Being able to believe that in yourself mm. is really, really important. Yeah. You know, one of, one of the things that I teach about leadership behavior, and this is just a little snippet, that when you're in a meeting with a group of people and you're in a team, you're in a team environment, you know, you, you, you might be the, the CEO or the CFO or the clinic manager or the clinic director, and you've got a group of people around you and you're working on maybe solving an issue together. You should be the last one that ever speaks. Mm-hmm. And you should, and you should never either acknowledge or disagree, agree or disagree in any way with anyone who is speaking as they're speaking. Don't, don't dismiss them by nodding affirmation or shaking your head in disagreement. Don't dismiss them. Let them speak. And, and that, that's that, you know, we all, I mean, it's very, it's very normal. Somebody's saying something, you agree with it. You're like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a natural reaction, right? But but let them, let them, let them experience that. Let them get it all out. Mm-hmm. And, and so part of it is it's that holding back, you know, one of the, the leadership gurus that I, that I just think is an amazing, he's like a genius when it comes to leadership is Simon Sinek, yeah. who's written, you know, just a multitude of books and, and he's got a, you know, he's, he's done Ted talks and podcasts and these YouTubes and channel. And, and um, he does, he has done a lot of work with the military and he wrote a book. Uh, I don't know when it was published, but it's still very readily available and it's called leaders eat last. Yeah. Which is, you know, which is a, a culture in the military, but he, he takes that cultural behavior which is expected in the military and extrapolates that into business. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's a really important behavior for leaders. I don't care what your business is. You know, let's, we're talking PT. You're in that team meeting. You speak last, mm-hmm. you know, let, because what you're doing is you, you are by speaking last, you are showing everyone else in there that you want to hear what they have to say. You know, there's, that's a big difference than walking into that meeting, clapping your hands, saying, okay, everybody, we know what the issue is. Uh, I think I pretty much got it figured out, but let me hear what you have to say. Ooh. How do you feel? Like someone on that team may have, may have spent hours or days working on, a, on how to present their solution, and you basically just went in and dismissed it. Are they going to want to follow you? Is that something – you misspoke and, and brought up the book Crucial Conversations. Yeah. And I don't think it was in Crucial Conversations. Maybe it was in Five Dysfunctions of a Team by mm-hmm, Patrick mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you're going to encourage conversation and they he very much encourages debate, healthy debate amongst sure. team members, by bringing up your own idea, by bringing in uh, your solution, the people that have other ideas are going to be stifled. Yes. And yes. they're going to learn very quickly that their voice doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And that leads to a culture where uh, inadvertently, yeah, you might have the answer, but you are going to become the answer man or woman from then on. Yes. And that's going to breed the culture of your clinic such that everyone's just followers. They're just going to do what Nathan says. They're going to do what John says, and we're all mm-hmm. going to go along quietly which is exactly what you don't want as a culture, even though you know the answer or you think, you know, you think, you know, the best answer, <laughs> right, right, be very right. good answers that might even be better than yours. And you just don't know it. Um, uh, and yes, you do come to that problem typically with some experience having been the main uh, employee of that company for a period of time. Yet um, to, to let everyone else come up with ideas and give it back to the team. So even if a problem comes from the team to then turn around and give that back to them, I think that notion, that idea, that um, action in and of itself breeds an entirely different culture than if they come at you with a problem and may, and this might be going back to a little bit of the self-management because I thought if it does get very heated and they say, well, what about this? 
I think what I've learned over the years, not this, that this is right and the best way to do it, but what if you just gave it back to them? And so what do you guys think we should do about it? Well, you're the <laughs> owner there. You have all the answers. Well, yeah. But what if you guys were the owner, what would you do? Right. Right. What would you, how would you handle it? If I would, if I made you CEO for the day, here's the magic wand being, you're the CEO. Now, what would we do? What should we do? Okay. That's a great idea. Who else has some ideas? All right. And, and I think that it, turning that back to them to find the answers from within might discharge it, things a little bit, but also starts developing a culture where, okay, you can come at me with a heated emotional argument, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to come back at you with more emotion because that goes nowhere. Then we start getting into emotional responses instead of logical responses, which is what Ab we want. Absolutely. And, so and you mentioned, that, yeah. I like that, how you brought that up. And you mentioned crucial conversations and, and I, and I, you know, inadvertently brought that book up. That's kind of the other, the other really key book that mm -hmm. I think every, every uh, PT owner should be reading because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you certainly at this point, you've had crucial conversations. Mm -hmm. Maybe they went well, maybe they didn't. The techniques and the, the very practical advice that's given in there, it really speaks to, you know, some of the points you just brought up and, and, you know, I think one of the, um, one of the, the, the principles in that book is you, you need to, to, what they call start with the heart. Like, what do you want out of that conversation? Yes. What do you want out of that relationship? How do you Maybe want to with feel after that, yeah, after that conversation? If you understand what you want, what's the goal? Let's say it's a patient relationship. I want this patient to get better. I want them to meet their functional goals. Everything you do should be moving toward that at all times. Mm. So that when you have a heated, you know, there may be a heated conversation with a patient. Maybe it is about their sporadic attendance or something like that, or non-compliance with a home exercise program. You know, at the end of the day, how you have that conversation, if you have the, the end goal in mind, mm -hmm you know, you are much more likely to proceed in that conversation in a way that respects that person's position. Right. You want to find out, you want to know what their story is. Don't presume you know why they're not being compliant, you know, why they're missing appointments. Don't, don't, don't create a story if you don't have the data, mm -hmm. you know, asking lots of questions rather than assuming, ah, you know what, I don't think they think this is important. You know, they're always talking about their job, their jobs probably, you know, you, you're creating a story that's not based in any fact. You're just, right. you're telling yourself a story right. to make yourself feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to really come down on them. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I can blame them. I can blame them. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. they are at fault. Right. Yeah. Right. Coming up with that story, uh, getting past self-awareness, self-management. Are there any other factors that tend to stand out that you recall? I think the other thing that really weaves its way through all leadership, really good leadership theory and teaching is consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, how you are displaying these leadership behaviors is, is important, but how often you are at it is, is really important. You know, it, you know, it, it's, it's not a good culture if you as the, you know, clinic manager, director, the even, you know, maybe even the office manager on an admin side. If, you know, your staff thinks, oh boy, it's Monday, here she comes. All right, everybody keep their head down, just do your work, don't talk, you know, but on Tuesday, she's bringing flowers. I mean, you know, like that, that's a dramatic co contrast, yeah, but the yeah, yeah the, you know, people want consistency. They want to know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I, and Simon Sinek talks about this a lot, this concept of safety. Mm. And, you know, people, you know, in, in very early, the very early period of human history, people banded together for safety, right? They banded together for safety, right? Being together in a community is, is almost a primordial reassurance of safety. And if people in that community, you know, are consistently behaving, that creates even greater safety. Now, if you have someone in that community who goes rogue and is fanatical one day and beautiful the next, you know, that's not a nice feeling. That, I mean, that, that insecurity is not good. You do not want a culture 
where your staff is t- tiptoeing on eggshells mm-hmm. because number one, you know, when you, when you ask for people to raise their hand to help with something, eh, I don't know if I want to work with him and I'm not sure what I'm going to get. Right. And, and I think part of that is you are consistent in all situations. And this is where it's hard. This is why leadership is hard. You know, you, you, you're coming into, into work and something's happened at home. Could be anything, family, health, whatever. You know, you, you, you really can't let that jump in the way of how you, you manage those relationships at work. And, and I've told people, I said, if you can't, and, and it's, it's okay if you can't do that, but you got to take, you got to tell me, and I got to pull you out because I can't, as the, as the leader of the company, I cannot, I can't um, have someone who reports to you feel that they're not being supported because you're not capable of, of doing what you need to do. And that's not, that's not because, you know, you're, you're failing. It's just, you're in a, you're in a place in life that's not allowing you. That's okay. It's okay to not be perfect all the time, but you have to know when you're not so that you don't leave a body by the road. I think that's what, um, you see that in employees as well as leaders and as Mm -hmm. leaders, it's more magnified, of course, but the best employees are those who are consistent. If you're consistently bad, that makes it very easy for me to let you go. Absolutely. If you're consistently Absolutely. good, then you're going to stand out. It's yeah. when you vacillate and you have the roller coaster and some days are good and some days are bad. And sometimes they show up and sometimes they don't. And, but if you, to get that in a leader is that much more magnified because it's very difficult to lead a team in, in that regard. Like you said, they don't know what, how to respond. They, if they're especially going to get different answers, depending on the day to the same question, you just setting up for chaos at that yeah. point. It's really uh, difficult. It's, and so it's important yeah. that there be some structure to it. And I think some of that consistency can provide safety in structure. And that's yes. why it's so much so important to stress policy, procedures, systems, you name it. This is how we do things. And it, when there is that structure, then I think that lends to safety. And and feeling of safety amongst the team. If, if the employee handbook has all the answers, then I know I can trust the employee handbook. That's right. If I know exactly how to uh, request pay, uh, time for paid time off requests. If I know how to do that and there's a system in place and I know exactly how it's going to get denied or, or uh, approved, then I can have some safety and understanding why either way. But I think that goes to it as well. That consistency can be seen in leadership, but it also is seen in leaders who set up structure. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, the, it's, it's so important. That's a great point. You know, those policies and procedures and that structure, when it's adhered to consistent, consistently, that builds even more safety. Right. And, and I think that's, um, that's really, really important. You know, when people know what to expect, they just feel so much safer. They really, really do. I think it's, it, you know, I've always felt that structure, however you want to define that, whether it's an employee handbook, it's the, your organizational chart, you know, a, a listing of roles and responsibilities, accountabilities, your policies and procedures, that stuff now, I know this now, and again, you know, I don't want people to sit here, sit or listen to this and think, oh, this guy is really, you know, he, he's really got all, I've made every mistake possible. And I've yeah, often told Steve, years to figure out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 15, <laughs> overnight success took 15 years. And I've yeah. often shared with my partner, Steve, I said, you know, we could do a lecture on how to do everything wrong and still be in business. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think that structure is not meant to create convenience. Structure is meant to create safety and consistency and ultimately a really high quality product, you know, you, you, because, you know, if, if you really look at structure, whether it's requesting paid time off or, you know, whatever you have in your, in your clinic, you know, there, there's a certain amount of time that it takes to execute the, these structures. And, you know, you don't, you don't build structure for, for convenience, you know, you could sidestep all that by having a shout conversation, you know, two doors down the hall and say, you need Friday off. Okay. Yeah, no problem. But if that deviates from the structure, it was more convenient 
but then why didn't the person who requested time off two weeks ago who heard that occur, why didn't, why weren't they able to shout down the hall to ask for time off? You know, it, it's, it's about, it's about trust and, and consistency. That's, and, and, and as PT owners, and it particularly for Steve and myself, and I'm sure many people listening to this, hey, for a long time, we were chief cooks and bottle washers. We did everything, you know, we fixed the broken windows, we fixed the equipment, we cleaned the office. You know, there was so much informality to the management and ownership of our practices in the early days. It's kind of hard to break from that and to adhere to a structure because we're so, you know, we were so informal for so long, sometimes to our detriment. So I, I, you know, I would, I would really encourage practice owners that that structure really helps with this whole leader, leadership scheme. I, I know you might have more to share. We're coming up against it as far as time, but one thing yeah. I wanted to ask you about, and it, uh, it struck home with me in reading Jocko Willink's uh, Extreme Leadership book. Yeah. But, um, and it's in the, within the very first few chapters was that uh, everything comes back to the leader. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, things go well, it's on the leader. Things go bad, it's on the leader. And I think that's something that I didn't necessarily take on as, as an, a newer leader. That if there were mistakes, it it was their problem, right? They did something yes, wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where now I can look back at it and see that they were probably acting out because out of they were acting out because they were in a state of confusion, lot maybe lack of safety. Yep. And they didn't exactly know where to go next. And so they maybe did something on their or or they forgot or you name it. But even if it was a, a matter of forgetting, is because I maybe didn't set up the expectation ahead of time and didn't mm -hmm. hold them accountable the first couple of times they did it wrong. And now they're doing it a third time. And I didn't say anything the first two times. So it's hard to hold them accountable now. I mean, I think a lot of it comes back to poor leadership when you're um, if you're not un understanding that anything that goes wrong in your clinic can be directly uh, related back to the leaders. There, there's that expression, the fish stinks from the head down, hmm. you know, and I think, I think you're right. I think by, you know, because we, you know, most practice owners tend to have built the practices themselves. I don't want people to take this the wrong way, but there's an inbred arrogance that it can't be me. Right. You know, yeah. um, you know, I, I kind of built this, um, but I think that's, that goes back to that self-awareness again. So, you know, it, it all keeps mm -hmm. cycling back to what, it, what, you know, who, who am I really, you know, when I'm, when I'm acting in my clinic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh that was, that's something that really hit me and I didn't, quite understand <laughs> going back to, you know, it took me 15 years to figure it out. Um, is that, you know, I would, could definitely be the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, even if my clinic was quote unquote successful, any issues that I might have within a clinic could come back to me and my lack of willingness to put time and attention and energy on, onto it. And some of it might've been out of naivety, uh, or ignorance because I didn't know how to run a clinic. I hadn't all, I decided to open a clinic and I had no business ownership experience in the past. Right. That explains mm -hmm, most mm -hmm. PT owners. Sure. Right? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, there's some ignorance in that regard. Um, but that doesn't absolve me of the fact that, that I need, I needed to take the time to learn and get some support, get some guidance, read the books, listen to the podcast, get a coach, you name it to figure out what it really meant to be a business owner. And I'm assuming yeah. that's kind of what it took you over the years to do the same. Absolutely. And yeah. And I mean, you know, as PTs, um, you know, we're, we're trained to, you know, to treat patients, you know, to do differential diagnoses, to develop plans of care, to execute the plans of care, you know, th this, this, you know, uh, you know, the, the course that Steve and I, you know, in our dreams want to teach how to do everything wrong and stay in business, you know, we, we could fill that with all these examples of what we were never taught. And we just, you know, we did something if it, if it didn't work, well, okay, that didn't work. And here we'll try this. And, and that includes our behavior. You know, mm -hmm. it took us, it took us a long time with a lot of intensive coaching and, you know, and, 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 and to some extent, it really didn't begin to hit for me and for Steve until we started to back a little bit away from patient care. Yes. You know, once I began to back away from patient care and get my nose out of the, 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 the patient book, so to speak, I really began to understand how I was operating and it wasn't always pretty. Yeah. 
you, you have to have the time to sit back and, and reflect and see and listen and you know, watch, observe. And yeah. if you're treating patients the entire time, you can't do that. Plus your brain space is filled with so many other things. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's hard to put the energy on ownership at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And got it. All right. So let's wrap up this part, part one in part two. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about developing leadership within your clinic. We talked a little bit about how to manage younger team members at the very beginning of this episode, but we're going to 